On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Many islands lie in the sea between Great Britain and Scandinavia. All of these islands would have remained snow covered and life would not have been sustainable were it not for the Gulf Stream. The warm waters flowing through the Atlantic Ocean all the way to South America account for the mild island climate, rich nature, and history that reaches back thousands of years. Such are the three islands we are about to visit in today's Miracles of Nature, Vesterolen, the Fair Isle, and the Orkneys. Three islands, three unique places, three stops. Firstly, we will introduce the miracle by the name Vesterolen. Vesterolen lies to the south of the famous Lofoten Islands and is comprised of many small islands, the largest of which, Hinoya, at 2,250 square kilometers, is Norway's second largest island. Population on the islands is very sparse, ensuring that the surrounding nature is unspoiled by man, and Vesterolen remains an all-in-one reservation of Nordic nature. The highest mountain, Moiselen, despite its mere 1,262 meters, stands proud and tall above a fishing village and can be seen from the seaside. From its peak, one can admire the crystal clear lakes, lush pastures, and the rugged coast where many different kinds of birds nest. The winter is relatively mild on Vesterolen. Come spring and summertime, the meadows become adorned with colorful flowers. Because Vesterolen lies past the Arctic Circle, visitors can marvel at the magic of the polar day in the summer when the sun never sets below the horizon. The first explorers who witnessed polar days were the Sami people. Thousands of years ago, the Sami people were hunters. It's only recently that they turned to agriculture. The rearing of reindeer is not as popular on the islands nowadays as it was in the past. Nevertheless, 50,000 of these ruminant animals live in Norway, which is more than half of today's world reindeer population. The herds are supplemented through official game captured in the mountains of Vesterolen. Reindeer are utilized in many ways and are a sort of Nordic cow. They provide not only meat, but also milk. Unlike the more sensitive cattle, they are a lot hardier toward the harsh Nordic conditions. As such, their hide is valuable material for warm clothing. At first glance, it may seem as if we were transported to a forgotten Caribbean island with sandy beaches and a turquoise blue sea. On the contrary, we are still in Vesterolen, experiencing the fairer aspect of the otherwise rough Nordic landscape. The unspoiled coastline attracts many migratory as well as resident birds that nest in the high cliffs above the sea. A sea eagle in particular reaches giant dimensions with its wingspan of 2.5 meters making it Europe's largest bird of prey. The sea eagle shares the blue sky with the considerably smaller puffins, who live in colonies on the shore. Puffins are deceiving for their size. In reality, they are the masters of flight with an ability to beat their wings 400 times per minute, 
to reach a speed of 90 kilometers per hour. Vesterolen is a true paradise for bird watchers. All one needs to do is stand still and take in the fulmars, puffins, gannets, or attempt to spot the four different kinds of skua. Here, human interference with nature is almost non-existent. On the few occasions that human interference is necessary, it is done in a way that is in perfect harmony with nature. Nature rewards the human efforts by stunning manifestations of its grandiosity. A good example are the dramatic waterfalls fed by water from melting snow and surface lakes. Some of the waterfalls are hundreds of meters high and during spring thawing can become very wide. Water in particular is a fitting symbol. Similar to the waterfalls, the nature is pristine, wild, and self-assured that it will remain beautiful and unspoiled, a true masterpiece. The trademark of Vestarol is the contrast of roughness and serenity. On the one hand, you may wander along hundreds of kilometers of trekking paths through a landscape dominated by calm lakes and lush meadows. On the other hand, one can watch in awe as the water rushes madly over jutting rocks or let oneself be stunned by the enchanting beauty of Nordic fjords. Vesterolen, just like Norway as a whole, would not be the same without fjords which are a legacy of times long gone. They were created during the Ice Age when glaciers retreated into the sea. An immense mass of ice flowed through river valleys and tore the landscape, leaving behind these immense scars. The sun sets above Vesterolen, letting us know that it's time to move on a few hundred kilometers to Great Britain's most isolated island, the Fair Isle. Fair Isle lies 38 kilometers from the Shetland Islands and is the furthest inhabited territory of the British Isles. It would seem that its surface area of 768 hectares does not make it a place where people would willingly settle. Even so, the island was first inhabited in the New Stone Age and has remained populated ever since. The Gulf Stream ensures that winter temperatures don't fall below 5 degrees Celsius and that the summertime average is a pleasant 20 degrees. Today, there are 80 regular inhabitants on the island who work mostly in agriculture. Old Vikings used to call it the Sheep Island. The current name, Fair Isle, is derived from the fact that it's an exceptionally quiet and peaceful island and a significant place to Scottish historians and ecologists. As such, it is under the protection of the National Trust of Scotland, a charity organization which leases land to the inhabitants and thus safeguards the environment. Anyone who is granted a permit to stay must deal with the isolation and with the unbridled sea all around, assaulting the coastline day and night. Those who stay are generously rewarded by nature. A living spectacle unfolds both in the sky and in the many bays. The surrounding waters are among the richest in Europe in terms of the different kinds of animals living here. There are 21 different types of sea mammals, of which five are seals, including the rare Atlantic gray seal. Fair Isle is a haven for seal families. The pristine sea all around provides an abundance of food and security. 
The only things the seals must watch out for are the breakers and the killer whales. The seals mask their slyness with cuteness, but that won't help when a killer whale attacks. Their agility is what matters. Their incredible maneuvers can save them from an attack by these feared predators. Marine biologists are convinced that seals thrive here as they count tens of newborns every year. The Southern Lighthouse was the last electrified lighthouse in Scotland in 1998. This implies that while civilization is a mere few hours flight away, its noise reaches Fair Isle with a considerable delay. Sheep farming has been, and still is, the most important trade for most of the islanders. Sheep have forever been a means to survive and a source of income. Their wool is considered to be of the finest quality, and knitting sweaters with the typical local pattern is a matter of tradition. It is almost as well known as local mutton. The mystery of superb wool and delicious mutton from Fair Isle is easily solved. The sheep fare extremely well here, and so the farmers can experiment with various breeds. A cross of the Shetland, Texel, and Cheviot sheep, for example, feels right at home here. The farmers also often keep South African rams to give the sheep that special spark, they say. At one time, there were so many sheep on Fair Isle that pastures became insufficient. In the middle of the 20th century, the farmers had to use every single available grassy patch. Each summer, they used to transport herds of sheep to the inaccessible sheep rock using unsteady boats and ropes. It was well worth it. On Fair Isle, fauna is manifested in the sea, on land, and in the air. Due to its suitable position, the island becomes a resting station for thousands of migratory birds each year. As such, Fair Isle is the perfect bird watcher's site. The popularity of bird watching is the direct result of the work of George Watterson who bought the island in 1948 for 3,500 pounds sterling and established a bird observatory here. He thus combined the scientifically beneficial observation of the behavior of migratory birds with securing the future of the islanders. The island was decimated by the Second World War, and had it not been for Waterson Station, the Fair Isle may have long been forgotten. Seagulls and cormorants are among Fair Isle's permanent residents. In the winter, there are also widgeons, teals, golden eyes, woodcocks, and glaucous gulls. Watching their antics from the height of the cliffs is so vivid that one almost perceives each movement of the wings and every gust of wind. The place becomes a true bird watcher's paradise with the onset of the main migratory season in the summertime, when gigantic flocks of puffins and other birds arrive. George Waterson did something unprecedented for the island, and his followers strive to fulfill his legacy. The employees of the Ornithological Observatory put up nets on carefully selected spots for capturing and monitoring of birds. Each day, Derek Shaw checks all the nets and carefully rings the captured birds.
Through his work, he not only fills in the blanks with scientific facts about the routes of the migratory birds, but also monitors the numbers of the fair isle wren that are endemic here. Derek has a steady job, but he's also in charge of the maintenance of the ornithological station. Its construction indicates just how important the birds of Fair Isle are to the rest of the world. The structure was co-financed by Great Britain, the European Union, and people of all European countries who helped through different collections. Europeans are the most common visitors that Derek guides through the island each summer. The station is not complete yet, once the building will be finalized, it will become a unique hotel from which to observe the world of birds. Let us leave Derek to successfully complete the building and the birds to continue singing while we take a look at the Orkneys. The 70 islands belonging to the Orkney Archipelago near Great Britain are split into three groups, the mainland and the northern and southern islands. The Orkneys are under British administration now, but it hasn't always been so. History has been unfolding here for the past 4,000 years, ever since the first settlers arrived. The proof lies in the Neolithic monument called Skara Bra. The Stone Age village is one of the best preserved settlements of its kind in Europe. The placement of the houses and fragments of their fittings are still visible. The climate is very much affected by the Gulf Stream. Archaeological findings indicate that the Orkneys became popular thousands of years ago, particularly due to their mild climate and excellent seafood. Unlike the rest of Europe, the islands were not covered by snow and ice, and the sea provided the necessary nourishment. The Orkneys are more or less entwined with ancient history. Beside the official sites administered by the government, it is also possible to visit other private Neolithic tombs and excavation sites that the landowners often find accidentally while digging a well. The peaceful seaside meadows are known for their colorful flowers, such as sea asters, sea squills, and the Scottish primrose, which are endemic to the Orkneys. The Orkneys witnessed a turbulent past not only in ancient history. The Royal British Navy had a strategically important base in Scapa Flow Bay. Winston Churchill realized the vulnerability of the port and had concrete embankment built as protection against submarine attacks. The feat was completed by a thousand Italian war prisoners. Only one German submarine ever made it into Scapa Flow. The embankment today serves as an ideal breakwater or bank for roads. Vikings also used the 300 square kilometers of Scapa Flow as a port. The average depth of just 30 meters makes it a calm bay ideal as a source of seafood. The tranquil waters warmed by the Gulf Stream are an ideal habitat for many creatures. My favorite local delicacy is the brown crab. The adult brown crab may reach 25 centimeters in diameter and weigh up to three kilos. Each winter, the female crab lays between 250,000 to three million eggs. The males grow at a rate of one centimeter per year in the first eight years of their life. The growth then slows down to some two millimeters per year. The females grow at half that rate.
over half the world's annual catch of the brown crab, which amounts to about 50,000 tons per year, is caught right here in Scapa Flow. People are not the only ones that indulge in the succulent crab delicacy. The seal population is just as fond of it. Man is an inventive creature who always manages to make the best of any natural wealth. A good example is Britain's northernmost whiskey distillery. The typically strong, smoky taste of the local single malt is acquired by processing wheat, which is heated up on grates fueled by turf. The wheat is left to ferment and then is distilled twice. Afterwards, it's left to mature for a minimum of 12 years in oak casks that were once used for sherry. The distillate thus acquires its special taste and color. The extensive plains of the Orkney Islands are ideal for sheep farming, just like all of the other northern islands washed by the Gulf Stream. The sheep here have an unusual dark shade of wool and a very distinctive taste to their meat. This is because they feed on grass and also on sea kelp washed up on the shore during low tide. The sea kelp forms a part of their staple diet and accounts for the special shade of wool and also for the rather unusual taste of the meat. Don't let yourself be misled. Although they do look like goats, they really are sheep. Close-knit contact with nature and the abundance of seals in the surrounding waters give rise to legends of the seal people. In local mythology, the seals can turn into beautiful people and can be helpful to humans. The polluted waters and the sometimes forgotten fishing nets can hurt the seals, and so the people of the Orkneys actively look after their well-being in an attempt to preserve them for generations to come. Just like the Fair Isle, the Orkneys also lie in the way of the birds' migration route. Visitors benefit from a perfectly balanced experience of natural wealth and a long and rich history. The islands haven't changed much since times long past, and so offer the same fauna and flora that was admired by the ancient Orkney inhabitants, the Vikings, as well as the officers of the Royal Navy. The sun sets above the islands, above the Orkneys, Vesterolen, as well as the Fair Isle. All of these locations introduced in today's episode prove that there is no shortage of fascinating nature and dramatic scenery in the northern latitudes. The murky sea may at times assault the high cliffs and the wind blows madly over the open plains, but the islands remain spared from the frosty fingers of the Arctic climate, and so people, as well as animals, thrive here. This is a miracle, a miracle of nature that we strive to bring closer to you in this program. Miracles are often associated with fairy tales, but we are on a quest to prove that anyone can experience miracles in real life. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we shall wander into Africa, particularly to Zimbabwe, where in Matabele land, we'll encounter the beauty of typically African animals. On the Zambezi River, at the borderline with Zambia, there are breathtaking waterfalls in store for us. That's all right here 
on Miracles of Nature. We hope you'll join us.